about uh, detective fiction, detective stories. Uh, it'll be a mix of detective literature as well as some of the TV series uh, that are famous. And uh, I feel like they are good to study because they're different from each other. The characters are rich, the clues as well as the overall storyline is pretty intriguing. So with that, we start with the quote from Sherlock Holmes. My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people do not know. So this is a quote from the story, The Blue Carbuncle. Uh, as the luck would have it, that was actually the first detective story I had read while growing up. I think it was part of our uh, English literature school syllabus. So now, uh, this is what we are going to talk about that how the detectives, they ensure that they know more than the other people. However, uh, while we are writing as an author, as a writer, your approach will be completely different. And uh, we'll, we'll touch upon that a little bit. <clears throat> uh, disclaimers and rules stay the same. The only addition is today I have used a lot of material from chat GPT as well as my own research. So uh, in case you need any references, you need any help with any of the stories, do let me know and I'll share the list. However, next week we will be going through some uh, stories in detail. And today at the end, we will discuss a little bit about um, the Oriental Express. So week five, uh, the other announcement is that for the forthcoming weeks, week six, seven, and eight, instead of having two sessions, uh, that is on Saturday and Sunday, uh, I'm planning to have only one session and I'll try to cover all the topics that are mentioned on the slide and distribute the time accordingly. So I'm targeting only the sessions on Saturdays for next three weeks. That's one change. I'm yet to inform the Nalanda team. I'll do that later today. Okay, so let's start with this. So my first question is, how many literary detectives can you name other than Sherlock Holmes, Akupaho, and Miss Jane Marple or Miss Marple? So I'll wait for a minute. Please put your responses on the chat. I'm not talking about TV detectives or the TV series or the movies. So have you read anything other than Sherlock Holmes, Akupoho, and Jane Marple? Or you can just say simple yes or no. If you have, if you know anyone, you can share the names. So there is a book series and it's available on YouTube. It's called Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. So let's see, no, so I don't know, okay. And uh, it, it's a good series of audio books, as well as there are some BBC radio dramas and some of the authors or the characters that we'll discuss today. Uh, I'll request you to go through their stories on YouTube or if you can buy the books or find the free stories online on Gutenberg Press. Now, uh, please go through these. So let's start with August Dupin. August Dupin was created by Edgar Allan Poe and is considered the first fictional detective. Now, because this character is the first one, a lot of uh, characteristics or the traits of this particular detector, a detective were, very, were pretty straightforward. So just to tell you a little bit, he's intelligent, he's analytical. That means that uh, he can break down the complex problems into smaller, more manageable parts, and then try to fit all of them together to resolve. Deductive reasoning, to draw logical conclusions based on the evidence presented to him. Uh, meticulous and observant, extremely observant and notices even the smallest details. Logical, does not rely on intuition or guesswork, but instead uses logic 
and reason uh, independent and confident uh, you'll see independent and confident repeatedly because the two aspects to that first is that the detective or whosoever the, whatever character we're going to talk about does a lot of work alone and secondly whenever there is a situation to call out or to present the finding based on his or her uh, her own analysis they are very upfront in doing that so they are confident they they understand the importance of the situation however they also know that their own process is dependable one and that's what's uh, that's why you'll see confident repeatedly on some of the slides a perceptive understands the actions of others to find the motives of the perpetrator and now you'll see uh, the richness of the characters will work based on as and when Carl Jung started presenting his findings on psychological studies a lot of detectives or the stories written after that particular study actually had really good psychological appeal or emotional connect and then at the end uh, he's creative he comes up with unique solutions by thinking outside the box this is again uh, mentioned repeatedly now we go to one of the most famous detectives of all time Sherlock Holmes I think this is one of the most played characters by different people in various form forms of uh, uh, entertainment so the first group of skills is similar to the group from Dupin high intelligence attention to detail logical thinking self-confidence and here it's called out that uh, Sherlock trusts his instincts and is not afraid to take risks and independence he's firstly independent prefers to work alone uh, often both Paco and Sherlock, they will not share their studies or their findings. You will only see in the story, it's written that uh, they were experimenting, they were uh, not eating food for a couple of days or for a cube. Paco, it's more like he's playing with his cards just to di distract his mind so that he can then go back and focus. So independence as well as uh, how you uh, handle that situation in your story because they will share the conclusion or the findings of their experiment at a later stage. They will not right away tell uh, what experiment they are doing and what are the findings. Now, what are the unique characteristics of Sherlock Holmes? Eccentricity. He's socially awkward, but that gives him a unique perspective because he is so isolated. He has a lot of time to think about it. There are some stories in which he tells Watson that I'm so bored. I feel like I should go out and commit some crime and it should be a perfect crime rather than socializing in the society. And you see his social stature. His brother is pretty well known and well connected politically as well as with the um, monarchy or the government of the time however sherlock stays aloof and determination once he sets his mind on a case he will stop at nothing to solve it uh, we discussed it yesterday in one of our characteristic studies of enneagram this thing also leads some of these detectives to walk into the traps now this is <clears throat> uh, again based on what kind of character you are trying to make or write perfectionism again is not satisfied until he has solved the case completely and accurately uh, this happens repeatedly in some of the stories where the solution is too easy and too obvious and one such example is that a person has uh, uh, already a, uh, has confessed to a crime but the detective feels that the confession is wrong. There is a deeper reason for that and more uh, analysis are required. Uh, attention seeking. 
uh, Sherlock definitely seeks out cases that will challenge him mentally and allow him to show off his skills. Uh, we also discussed this, uh, one of his personality traits, he is antisocial, he insults people whenever someone takes a wrong uh, decision or a wrong deduction. And uh, uh, he ensures that he's vengeful at those times. So be very careful what kind of character you want to create. Uh, again, a uh, Agatha Christie's uh, stories they are as as a student i feel her stories are richer than connell doyle's and we'll i'll discuss that later when we go into the story types or uh, the different components of the story uh, i'll leave the methodical perceptive analytical and perfectionism similar to the previous two however akupaho's uh, unique capabilities are following uh, egocentricity, he has high developed sense of self-worth and often boasts of his abilities. You'll see him in a social setting when someone introduces himself as the greatest detective alive or world's greatest detective. He might make a, up a face or say something, but uh, he will be happy about it or he will repeat that or if he says so or something like that. Uh, fastidiousness, it's a, a combination of his attentiveness as well as his orderly lifestyle where he gives preferences or uh, preference to symmetry and tidiness. So I think in one of the stories, he wants eggs, boiled eggs that are uh, equal in height or the way he carries himself, the way he asks his friend Hastings whether his mustache one side is longer, the other side is smaller, uh, these kind of things. So he takes care of his own personal self a lot. He is egotistical. He takes great pride in his skills as a detective. Pretty much every other story, he has this discussion with Hastings uh, that why he's so good at it, uh, how the gray cells are good. And uh, the other aspect is he, he is kind of a showman because in most of his stories, he will get everyone in a room and then uh, detail how and uh, uh, what was his approach to solving the crime, what were the red herrings and how he was able to look beyond the traps that were set by the antagonist or the criminal. Patience. He is willing to wait for the right moment to make a break breakthrough in his investigations. He is polite and courteous, completely opposite to Sherlock. Uh, you'll never see him being rude to anyone except when he's angry with himself. Uh, the other aspect of his personality is that being a Belgian in London, you will consistently see him uh, talking. Uh, in a very good way or praising the lifestyle in London and missing his Belgian heritage. Orderliness, his strong sense of order and he's organized in his thinking and actions. And you can see that from the way he carries himself, the way his table or his appointments are scheduled. He's dependable. He's reliable in his work with promises and commitments. And the last one is emotional connection. Uh, the reason I added emotional connection is that in Agatha Christie's stories, you will see the if there is a death or if there is a theft, the person who is impacted is either a friend or a friend of a friend of either Miss Marple or Poho. And if during the story, Poho thinks that the person is danger and he's late and the person dies, he actually feels guilty about that. So uh, that's the case in some of the stories. One example is death on Nile. Uh, he feels that he could have solved the case earlier. He missed some of the clues. Okay. Miss Jane Marple or Miss Marple, again, Agatha Christie's character. Now, 
she's an old spinster living in a rural setting in england and uh, the best part about miss marple is that she is rarely called to investigate Poho and Sherlock Holmes, they are called to investigate. Poho sometimes is present in the so social situations, but Miss Marple is often uh, present in the situation where the crime happens. So uh, most of the times you'll see Poho and Miss Marple having a reading on the characters or having some background of the event. Now, Miss Jane Marple being an elderly lady, she has experience, she has really good intuition, she's empathetic towards others, again, patience there. Uh, she has really good memory and most of the times the, the police or others, they ignore her like she's just an old lady moving around and that's her strength that uh, uh, often during an investigation, she is not noticed by uh antagonists a uh, curiosity the way she asks the question and her overall uh body language is such that okay i just wanted to know i was just curious about this subject i don't want to be prying right so her her dialogues were pretty good that way discretion whenever she's talking to uh anyone for that matter one of her relatives with her friends with uh, young characters, she's always discreet. You'll rarely see her leaking out any information or any secrets unless they are at the end of the story to solve the case. Uh, objectivity, she is impartial in her investigations. Uh, you will see that uh, there are some characters in the storyline where you will see, okay, this character uh, must have committed the crime in a bad way. Uh, phase or the person is justified to do so but uh, uh, Miss Marple is very objective in that front she does not allow the personal biases a resourcefulness she will always have one way or other to solve the problem uh, although most of her stories do, do not involve a lot of forensics or other lab work or blood work but uh, whenever she needs to move around the city to the other towns to a certain place for investigation she is resourceful in that sense and you can see uh, she can connect with the other residents of her village or other whichever situation she is put into by having the right conversation and at the end perseverance she's very determined uh, the police especially repeatedly tell her, what are you doing here? Why are you bugging us? Don't you have anything else to do? Uh, you are just a gossiper from a rural village, etc. But she keeps doing her work. And again, creativity, observation, attention to detail, intelligence, and deductive reasoning. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you have heard about Dr. John Thorndike, but you must and I am saying must read uh, John Thorndike. Uh, John, uh, Dr. Thorndike is one of the first characters who is actually a medical legal professional. So uh, apart from being a doctor, he also studies law and uh, he knows the legal uh, processes, how to present his case in the court, how to argue, uh, because at that time, a lot of uh, processes involved the initial injunction just to understand whether the death of a person is suicide or is a murder or something. So Thorndike uh, understand the legal system and he is a doctor. So he doesn't need someone else to tell him the cause and time of death. He can identify weapon, drugs used in a crime, uh, forensic evidence, his own uh lab uh, he understands how and when and what happened how the different uh, objects were used during the crime and in one of the stories he actually argues against the use of fingerprints for a crime 
uh, chemistry and microscopy. So even the small particles such as hair fibers or to identify poisons and other substances, knowledge of chemistry and microscopy is used. Uh, he can disguise himself, gather information. Uh, I missed this on Sherlock. Uh, Sherlock's one of the capabilities also, he can disguise himself pretty well. Uh, code breaking, he can decipher the secret messages and uncover hidden clues. And uh, I mean, so in throughout his stories, you will find different examples where he can do that. And now is my favorite detective other than Agatha Christie's characters, Max Carados, uh, written by Ernest Brahma. Uh, there are a lot of stories of Max Carados online, but I will uh, request you to read. Uh, Max Carados, and the best part about Max Carados uh, is that he's a blind detective. Uh, however, uh, without his vision, he uses his other senses to gather information and solve cases. So uh, with his touch, he can um, look at the fake, uh, understand whether the, the coins are fake or not, the notes. He reads his newspaper using the uh, fingertips not the Braille newspaper, the regular newspaper. Uh, he has a keen uh, enhanced hearing, highly developed. So he picks up a lot of details. Uh, I forgot the name of the story, but in one of the stories he's kidnapped. And uh, uh, in another one, he actually gets into a gunfight with the villain and uh, he says that uh, I'm used to dark, but it's something new for you. So now I have the advantage. So a lot of good situations in Max Carados' stories. Uh, empathy, he can connect with others. Often you'll see the victims or the relatives of the victims talking to him and uh, uh, upfront he will make some comments about the room or other stuff and later on he'll say, okay, I'm blind. So uh, they won't believe that the, the other characters. He's a polymath, wide range of knowledge on many subjects, including literature, music, and art. He's charming, witty, that helps him gain the trust and cooperation of suspects and witnesses. Again, intuition, he can sense something is amiss and he directs himself to the right clue. See, the good part about Max Carados is that it is something so difficult to write because we are used to uh, reading about or listening about or watching the detectives that use observation uh, using their eyes. But Carados goes against uh, in that particular concept. And he has a strong moral code. If you see, uh, Sherlock Holmes doesn't follow a very strict moral code. Uh, however, Poirot and Miss Marple, they do follow a good, uh, very strict model code. So uh, Carados does that. He puts himself in risk at times just to ensure that he can solve the case. Uh, these are two other de uh, detectives. You can read their stories. They're good stories, but again, different perspective, different characterization. I'll just talk about Lord Peter Wimsey. He's uh, written by Dor Dorothy Sayers, but he's an aristocrat. He uses his charm and wit, extensive knowledge of literature and art, but he's more like a gentleman. His stories often explore the themes of class and privilege, uh, which may or may not be very engaging. But Father Brown is a beast who is uh, a well-respected person in the society. So he's a fictional character created by G.K. Chesterton. And this is a good character because uh, not only he uses psychology and empathy, he often uh, views the particular event from a moral and ethical context also. And he is non-judgmental. And he often uses psychological tactics to get out of suspects. He reads people well. He knows a lot of people, uses references uh, at times. I, I don't think he uses a lot of religious references. So his life 
or his detection is more to do with outside his own job, but the character is actually a priest. Um, but overall, a very good and rich character. And the last one is Love Day Brook. Love Day Brook is a fictional detective created by Catherine Louisa Perkis and C.L. Perkis. When she actually wrote this detective, she used C.L. Perkis because at that time the female uh, writers were not well respected or their books were not uh, accepted by the audience to, to greater success. However, she uses the feminine aspect of the detective in such a beautiful way. And a lot of these detectives actually take pot shots at Sherlock Holmes by saying, oh, a gentleman from the London who's a very world, oh, he's a world famous detective, even he could not solve the case and they're trying to hush this news. Or, uh, so the way she is given a case is that the case is so sensitive, the, the police commissioner, or I think she works in an agency, her boss uh, relies on her, but the police and uh, the other characters, they often ignore her. But again, she starts with attention to detail. However, she also brings in the feminine point of view to uh, talk about or to analyze dresses and hats, even the makeup uh, used by uh, different characters in the different phases of their lives. This guy, she blends well in her surroundings without arousing suspicion. She has understanding of women's issue. So she understands the challenges that women face. So she's able to have open conversations and talks to people with ease that helps her to gather the information. And you'll see this is something which is completely opposite to a character such as Sherlock Holmes or even Akupahu. But because when they go somewhere, they are demanding, they uh, command respect, and they want to call the shots, but not in this case. And attention to social dynamics, understand the complex relationship between people, ability to think on her feet, because she is in a situation where she knows that nothing is going to be given to her because of her name, because of her gender. So she understands the situation and she manages in uh, uh, them pretty well. Okay, so these are the eight literary characters. Any questions on these? Anything you'd like to know? Uh, next session, I'll be talking about one or two stories from each of them. Not today's session. Today, we are only having introductions about detectives and what are the different aspects of a detective story. In any case, if you have any question, you can share them. And if I cannot uh, answer them today, we'll have that discussion tomorrow. Okay, thank you. So next one, let's talk about some TV detectives. So Colombo is a very famous detective series from USA. And uh, the way Colombo talks to people, it is actually a method in interviewing your customers or understanding the problems of your customers also. In a lot of corporate trainings, management consulting, the Colombo way is often called out in some of the books. So the good thing about Colombo is that he is a working class police detective. He will, he's very humble. He'll often say, oh, I, I don't think I can afford it. Oh, how much is it? And I think in some of the, uh, episodes uh, he's often dealing with criminals who are rich who are pretty high up in the societal circle and uh, they'll tell him if you have to ask the price then you certainly can't afford it so this particular statement is used a lot in his stories or in his series uh, the other important aspect of colombo is that before the actual uh, detection or the police work starts, the crime is detailed. You, you already, you as an audience already know who committed the crime, and uh, the the problem that needs to be solved by Colombo is first is how to find out the person, second is how to get the right proof, and then uh, arrest the person. So 
he looks uh, beyond the obvious he has a really nice intuition and common sense a lot of his questions are actually related to common sense they are you know more to do with uh, why would you buy two bottles or why would someone meet you over here uh, in this kind of a place okay and uh, uh, he he uses a lot of such questions that uh, oh I, i was wondering if i could do something like that uh, how difficult is it to get into maybe a hotel or a resort uh, how much does it cost how expensive is this house and then he'll call up oh uh, as a police officer i am earning this much so you can say that i can uh, buy this house if i don't eat don't do anything else for next 50 years so he he comes up like that like a person who just there and uh, non invasive but at times he is little bit stubborn but only at the right time he will never start with that particular conversation uh he again attention to detail if it's too easy to solve if there are too many clues uh making his job easier then he will realize something someone is setting him up or someone is being set up humble demeanor you know discussions from the daily routine activities he'll often be seen in the similar clothes or jacket i mean he he'll do these little things he'll have a long list from the notebook and he'll say oh i want to ask you something oh let me check okay this is my grocery bill oh this is the list my wife gave me can you believe it it's such a big list and the other person he's losing patience so he's actually mentally playing the other person uh to lose control and say something that can be used he has a disarming personality he gains the trust of the suspects uncovers crucial information but he never comes out as foolish he might come out as an uh person who wants more information who is unaware of the situation but not foolish and he is intelligent he sees through complex and elaborate cover ups because the whole series is about how some people they commit a crime and then they uh, have this cover up either they'll make up an alibi uh, they'll call someone on going to place a to b and later on they'll showcase the importance of that call so overall a really good series to watch and understand the detective and the crime genre uh the second one is monk adrian monk is the character of tv show monk now this is uh, one of those characters where you have one story per episode but uh, there is a bigger problem that will be solved in a phased way so you actually have two parallel stories coming up as well as a lot of back stories so i would not suggest writing a character such as monk but to learn from the uh, overall drama the character of this particular person so just to give you a background there's a bomb blast and his wife is killed he was in the police at that time his wife was uh, i think a professor or a legal professional and he thinks that uh, his wife was killed because of him the bomb was meant to kill monk but kill wife and he becomes obsessive compulsive so he does all these stupid things he has long list of fears uh, he doesn't walk on the road where the uh, the stones are broken and so, so many things it's it's funny in a way so he's stuck to patterns but as a detective he is meticulous he has exceptional memory photographic memory he is intelligent and vigilant he is always alert and aware of his surroundings uh, he has deep empathy for others he connects with the victims and the witnesses so if someone calls him out oh, you should be ashamed of yourself he'll say oh i always am because he carries this baggage of guilt because of the death of his wife uh, however uh, he has this long list of phobias and anxiety but he pulls him uh, he puts himself in a danger to protect others or solve the case in different uh, story lines 
if he's afraid of flying, if he's afraid of germs, uh, different scenarios will play out. And he's persistent. I mean, he will call out uh, the the culprit, even if it leads to him being ostracized by his friends, his friends being put on a bad spot. So uh, the storyline in every episode, the one thing you look forward to is that what kind of breakdown he's going to have today in this particular episode. So if you get a chance, go through that also. Then there is a series called Psych. It was on Amazon Prime. I think it has been removed now. So the detective is a detective's name is Sean Spencer. He is like he's very relatable and likable. Uh, one example is that he and his friend Gus, whenever they go on a case, they're always hungry. They'll prioritize food over other activities, but they're working with the police. So a lot of police people, they don't like him. Uh, but this person is flawed and vulnerable. Uh, he will make a lot of mistakes. So he's actually a character you can relate to. I mean, any person can be that detective. He has an exceptional memory because of the training given by his father. His father is an ex-police cop and uh, uh, he trained him to be a cop, but he didn't go for the exam. He, so he's a person who changes his job, who uh, will take some stupid risks, do some mistakes, put the overall process in jeopardy. However, his unconventional approach uses humor and sarcasm to put the suspects off guard. And with his friend, he will often pose as psychic or other type of profession. They'll use funny names to make fun of each other. And uh, most of the times they'll do something illegal just to solve the case. So in one of the episodes, they are supposed to go after this art thief so both of them, they suddenly dress up like uh, Indiana Jones and uh, they carry a whip with them and they're doing all the stupid stuff on the way. However, this is like a very light-hearted comedy. Even Monk is a comedy, but Psych, I'll say on the comedy level is better, but uh, at a detective skills level, Monk is pretty awesome, top of the line. Again, another one, The Mentalist. Now, Mentalist, uh, the situation is that his wife and daughter were killed by a serial killer again. Uh, this is a series where every episode there is a problem to be solved. However, in the back end, there is a, a serial killer that Patrick Jane is chasing. And he has a, his background is that he was a mentalist or he used to con people uh, by being a mentalist, by telling them what they do. But overall, he uses a lot of psychological tricks. So mentalist is more to understand uh, the human behavior. And he uses observation, empathy, flattery, often to uh, understand the other person, to make them say something or uh, expose some information which otherwise they're hiding. He uses reverse psychology at times just to pick up a bet or challenge someone in doing something just to test that whether the what kind of behavior this person uh, exhibits again humor charm is there but uh, another tricks that he uses are visualization hypnosis it's more to do with <clears throat> how the uh, the bystanders or the witnesses helps them to understand what was happening to recall some of the events. And uh, a cold reading interrogation techniques, reading between the lines, he actually uses these to get the right information. He will sometimes throw in some wrong information, some bad words, some keywords and understand or uh, see how the criminal reacts to that information and from there he will try to uh, deduce what's next another part is you can see the tv detectives the modern versions so sherlock um the bbc series it's 
present time London, you have a lot of technology, you have a lot of social aspects in there, like Watson wants to get married or other aspects. Uh, Agatha Christie's stories have been on, I think, Sony Live recently, and they have really good twists. So first uh, is, and I, I didn't say that earlier, but Poiho uh, has been subject to various taunts because he's a Belgian. So often he's called, oh, he's the French guy, or oh, he's like this, or oh, you are an outsider. Uh, because of his mannerism and his uh, his body also he'll be often called uh, the egg-shaped head or he was a fat person like a penguin uh his friends are being ostracized because of his poor investigative skill at least in one of the stories inspector job instead of having an honorable retirement has been uh, fired from the job because of the mistake or because of the shortcomings of Boyho's uh, investigation. And the, another aspect of uh, Boyho or Miss Marple in now is that can you make one of the stories without the main detective, but some of the main characters from the story actually play the detective? So that is a twist or the second option is if you can and this is one of the assignments i was planning to share with you all uh, if you can identify alternative ways or clues of solving the problem and the third part is if you can have a different criminal altogether within a similar storyline so if you can twist the story in such a way that can also help because you are using a lot of story elements from an existing famous story. Uh, Elementary is uh, again a Sherlock Holmes story based in New York City. So it has a different charm to it, being the American system, but Sherlock itself is, is British who has moved to New York City. Watson is actually a female character, a doctor, a surgeon who's actually helping Sherlock because Sherlock is alcoholic. So he has to stay and uh, because of the substance abuse. And even in the original Sherlock, uh, in, in yesterday's discussion, we understood that some of the investigators, they can be obsessed and uh, they can be uh, involved in self-deprecating activities. So in this particular case, that is how Sherlock starts. He's having family issues. His father is actually a pretty big uh, deal breaker and he considers him you know, the king of the evil empires across the globe. And he had group of helpers. He himself is in, uh, Sherlock himself is involved in a lot of weird activities, but whenever he needs expert hackers, uh, thieves, car hijackers, he, all, he has this group of helpers around him. So these are like modernized versions of our old literature. I'll take a pause. This is where we end this section on the detectives. Any other detectives or characters which you feel that can be discussed or that are good examples, I would request you to share on the chat or send the stories or links on the email. That's up to you how you want to play it. <clears throat> Any questions till now? on the various characteristics or various, I'll, uh, we are not psychologically profiling them because then it will become too strict. We just need to understand how and why these characters are like that. Okay. <laughs> They're not, not types of detectives, Kajal. It's more of that how do you want to create a character of your detective? So, for example, if you compare Sherlock and Akupaho, uh, Sherlock is very rude and arrogant. But Poho is also egotistical. He likes his own praise. He says out that he's the best detective but he is socially active. He's very respectful. 
he'll always tip his hat or the way his mannerism are shown in the book also the way he talks to his friends and people around him uh, you will rarely see him frustrated whereas sherlock's most conversations are <coughs> excuse me he comes out arrogant and same way when you want to create a female detective we have two example miss marple an elderly lady who uses social settings to get into or how the crime uh, is uncovered and then she works on the clues versus love de brook who is a young lady but she has been given responsibility by her boss who uh, respects her a lot and knows that she can resolve even the toughest of the uh, problems and the female characters are often uh, discriminated against that why are you here are you here for gossip are you here for uh, learning something new and all that so the police and others will mock them at times okay they may or may not have a lot of help available to them and the last part is how do they use their gender to ensure that they solve the case how can they be more forthcoming with the witnesses how can they understand the female mind better than the male detectives so it depends on you how you want to create your own detective same way monk or mentalist monk is an ex cop mentalist is an ex con man uh, sean spencer is just a troubled uh, young kid who has been doing stupid things and he doesn't know where he'll go from there but he ends up running the investigation okay so different background same way max carados the blind detective you take away the eyes of a detective traditionally we see that that uh, especially sherlock holmes he he says that he understands the smell and all then thorn dike uh his analysis are completely different okay so you can analyze these detectives in different ways but our purpose is to learn from all of them to create a complex character for our own stories and see the problem with series uh, as an author the problem is that you don't have that much time you don't have that much budget to create that so uh, at this time for a beginner level it's good to understand the story twists and how you can plug and play and make your story better story okay so we'll just talk a little bit about the human emotions that are discussed or that are used by uh, different uh, characters or the authors so cold reading or body language understanding uh, what the person is doing and here also you can uh disguise in some different way that a person is hiding something or the person is feeling ashamed but the person is not the actual culprit or the actual criminal then the power of suggestion you are suggesting different things to the uh to number of people in the room and you look for their reaction then impact of trauma or recalling such events how different people react to the stories of violence or theft or from different uh, country i think in one of the stories it's more about uh, a person says that i'm from boston but uh, in boston st patrick's day which is an irish festival is a big festival so the detective understands that uh, because this character doesn't know about that particular festival in boston on that day the person is lying so either trauma or recalling similar events uh, influence of the subconscious mind uh, it is often used as a priming technique where uh, the detectives or along with the help of police they will say okay we have already caught the person or they uh, intentionally provide some misinformation or fake news so that the actual culprit gets the sense false sense of security and ends up doing a mistake Uh, impact of guilt that is also if we have some strong uh, background stories to play with impact of guilt can be showcased 
a fear tactics again based on misinformation or betrayal uh more to do with two or three people and none of them is actually calling out who did the crime because uh, in again it depends on the legal system because in at least in the us legal system which has been producing a lot of movies and uh detective series officially you have to ensure that one person or the group of people they all they are all responsible for the crime however if there is a doubt if those people can name each other and finally the police or the legal department cannot make a case then all of them go free so in that case the fear tactics or even simple tactics like uh, uh, if there are two people or two suspects one suspect is like we have good cop bad cop and the second thing is the first suspect is kept without water without food however the other suspect is given a cold drink or some kind of junk food and he is walked uh, in front of him so that the first suspect can see that so that the first suspect feels like the second one has betrayed and he is getting all the good things from the police so a lot of brain games are being played uh, emotional response or reading that was the facial expression or was the overall reaction jealousy greed or anger then identifying obsessive behavior of the person based on the keywords based on the upbringing of that person uh, empathy or flattery i think we use that uh, patrick jane uses that to disarm the other person to get more information to evaluate whether the person is actually a suspect or not a reverse psychology challenging a person to do something or to get out of the closed shell to give more information mind games again manipulation technique uh mirroring is to create the trust to show a story to share something uh which is equally painful and uh, show show yourself as a vulnerable person so that the the suspect opens up and shares information a visualization again and hypnosis both are used to recall the events or to have the reaction to a certain event uh, often there are examples where i mean in reverse psychology and mind games the person will or the detective will intentionally say something incorrect and be very proud or be very arrogant about it and the criminal will correct the person and end up putting himself or herself in the situation where the crime was happening okay uh, interrogation technique uh, another one is reaction to the visual clues or the keywords <clears throat> and then a uh, reading between the lines understanding why the person is saying what it's saying or what he or she is saying and uh, how to interpret that how to learn from that behavior and ensure that the investigation goes in the right direction so uh, the reason i i mentioned uh, it i know it's a very short section the reason i kept this section is we have talked a lot about psychology so a lot of experiments are there even the leading questions the way you question the uh, the suspect uh the way you frame your question can be different and uh that was from the psychological experiment of uh, the car accident where when different questions were framed for different bystanders even though they had seen the same video or same visuals they provided different information and it can happen when your uh, detective is interviewing different suspects we'll be talking about some such stories next week uh, any questions on the section so far okay so now we look at the essential components of a detective story now we understood the story beats but they were very generic and most of the literature 
is related to the adventure genre mythology and uh, they are more on the patriarchal uh, structure of the society where the male members go out and try to save the day the females are female archetypes are more about uh, uh, themselves in distress naive or you know that there, there are very few stories around that however for detective stories there are some components that are essential you may want to create more than this however remember uh, your audience is very learned passionate and intelligent so people who follow the detective genre they want that mental engagement they can call out your clues up front so be very careful in reusing the plots uh, the role of the author while writing the story is that you are the antagonist you are the villain you are the bad guy and the reader is the detective so as you write the story the story flow should be in such a way that you are giving enough clues in a way that reader can catch you using her or his own intellect so while writing the story you are the antagonist you are planning something big however you have to ensure that you are giving enough clues to the reader that the reader is detective however at the end you solve and you provide the resolution so overall the components are characters the actual crime the clues social setup or the timeline uh, information asymmetry is very important if you will look at uh, we will we'll discuss that later and we'll go there procedure and risks as well as the forensics so we'll discuss each of them in detail now if you see the characters of detective story you need a detective or protagonist you need antagonist now antagonist uh, can be your suspect or he or she can be a puppet master or a criminal mastermind that works from the shadows and never exposes himself or herself so that's up to you the more complex the story is the more effort you have to put in the story okay uh, you need at least three suspects you need one suspect that is too obvious that is the suspect that is already being caught already uh looks good to everyone but your detective that is the suspect who might have the uh the weapon or the motive or the means to actually uh act however you need to also give some information that creates the doubt in the mind of the detective that this person may or may not be the suspect suspect 2 is your red herring red herring means during your during the investigation your reader as well as your detective should follow a false trail and find out a suspect or chase a suspect that will lead to either disproving of a theory or putting your detective in in harm's way or uh risking the reputation loss so suspect two is will not only waste the time and effort but also harm the reputation of your detective in some way and suspect 3 is your actual suspect uh, if you want to have more suspects you can have some person who is having personal grudge against the detective so detective character is defined that it's easier for me to arrest this person with the given uh clues and the given proof however detective being detective not because the detective is a good person or because of the moral responsibility but because the detective is mentally engaged with the problem and wants to solve the problem looks beyond that and solves the problem so 
that depends on you how you define your character your detective detective sidekick other than sanjam i would ask this question to others why do you need a watson for every sherlock can someone give the answer for every detective you will see a sidekick you will see a person who is with the detective why do we need that why, although most of our detectives are loners they are not married uh, they engage with the society only and when asked for or completely ignore that such as sherlock but they will always have a sidekick or a support character why it is no answer the reason is your side character or your detective's best friend his or her intelligence should be little bit below the intelligence of your average reader the reason for that is the detective sidekick is going to ask the questions about the process about the procedure that the reader has in his or her mind but detective cannot tell you or you cannot write that uh, i saw sherlock uh, playing with his test tube and chemical equipment trying to solve a problem no who will ask sherlock that what are you trying to do who will ask coiho uh, why did you go to the post office okay so you need a sidekick to ensure that your detective who is a highly intelligent being comes down to the level of your reader and explains these things the process to the reader but you must hide that much information that your detective resolves the problem in the final play in the final act of your story you need to have a police team that's up to you whether the police is friendly or not often the police inspectors are portrayed as uh, in in historically they were portrayed as dumb a uh, full muscle who try to resolve the problem with force uh, recently we have seen some cunning inspectors who either try to play the detective who are always looking for the mistakes made by the detective and then later on may or may not be a party to the crime so that's up to you how you want to make those characters okay uh, let me finish this slide kal like then you need other support characters such as doctor hacker forensic scientists or the characters in your story <clears throat> so the reason you need that is because your character cannot do everything on his or her own and that is a flaw in the recent sherlock if you see that sherlock he is also a chemical expert he is also running around uh in the army gear and trying to save irene adler and uh, so there are too many things he's playing too many roles and for sherlock if you see the original sherlock holmes the books he's uh, he plays violin to relax his mind or just because his upbringing is such uh he uses cocaine he uh, sorry heroin or cocaine i don't i don't remember exactly and i mean he's an addict and then he studies ashes or smells and other things so but but he keeps the details of all the events happening he keeps the newspapers he remembers information so that is something which you make up as a character okay or if you want support to be given to your character such as doctor hacker forensic scientist then you have to showcase those uh characters and give their specialization okay coming back to detective sidekick okay 
the question was that why do you need a Watson? Why do you need a Hastings with Poirot or uh, Watson with Sherlock? The reason for that is whenever Poirot or Sherlock are doing something exceptional, which is a uh, which is an action of a highly intelligent person, how will your reader understand what and why Sherlock or Poco are doing that? That is why you need Hastings or a sidekick in the story or Watson who asks the question to the main characters when main character explains the reason to these sidekicks, the actual target is your audience. Your audience is then engaged what's happening. Otherwise, you will lose your audience. For example, if in one of the characters, uh, sorry, one of the stories, I want a hacker. Okay, the hacker just needs to tell me, okay, they are using a VPN, they are using uh, a lot of uh, firewalls and they are bouncing the signal but uh, it is difficult so i'll need to rewrite something but i can find it but it will take two hours okay so you cannot expect sherlock to hack someone right that's not his forte but when sherlock calls a friend who's a hacker and then gets that information. At that time, it's important that Watson asks Sherlock, how did you know that? And then Sherlock explained, I call, you remember we visited or we met that person over there. He owed me a favor and he did this for me. Okay. So the reason for the sidekick is so that you can explain a lot of stuff to your audience. And this is not the case in science fiction. Remember in science fiction, often you can simply give a reason and you can go ahead. You can say, okay, a colony has been made on moon and uh, a computer is run. We are fine with that. You are not writing a textbook on science. You are writing a story. Okay. The actual crime, is it a robbery? Is it a theft? of something expensive? Is it a bank robbery, an art robbery, an international robbery? Uh, is it a murder or an attempted murder? Is it a large scale attack? Terrorist attacks and other such security issues have been the flavor since last 10, 15 years, actually last 30 years to say that. Stealing state secrets or industrial espionage. Uh, you can see the state secrets in uh, some of the Ocuparo or I think Greek interpreter is the Sherlock Holmes story. Then you have some people cheating to become wealthy or marrying someone for their money and then kidnapping. You, you can make a long list. That's up to you. These are some of the examples. So when and how it happens, how the... Uh, See, the higher the stakes, the more urgent the situation, the better it is for you because that sets up the story, that sets up the emotional engagement of your audience. So it's up to you how you want to set it. <clears throat> so the essential components are clues. What can be the clues? So you can have written, typed, or printed notes where you can see, okay, this typewriter makes this particular mistake or the person was actually cutting it for newspapers, then sending the notes, uh, handwriting analysis, the ink analysis, what kind of printer is being used, whether the printer is making mistakes that can be called out. Uh, then footprints, fingerprints, tire marks can be of any vehicle, uh, cycle, skates, uh, how the vehicle skid, whether the skid is in sync with the police report, then grease, oil, wax, oil types, dirt, chemicals. These will need analysis, uh, injuries, tattoos, bite marks, or scars just to identify the 
the person or the situation, whether the person was responsible or whether the person was uh, on the scene of the crime. Uh, damaged or fixed objects such as vase or clothes. So you can see somebody affix the suit with a different color or uh, a piece of that cloth is found at the crime scene. So these can be clues. Uh, it's like it has been fixed in such a good way that only an expert will do that. And uh, then you can find out the person who is there. A behavior, body language, reactions to keywords. Then eyewitnesses, alibi corroboration. So alibi, uh, eyewitness is the person who saw that or who comes forwards about the information. Alibi is where you're one of the suspects has someone who corroborates the story that no, this person was somewhere else at the time of the crime uh, or the event or the person could not have been there. Tools, guns, instruments, bullets, what kind of uh, objects are required to either create something and uh, whether the person or the suspects have access to such instruments. But the key is that you have to disclose these clues in a phased way. And then you have to mix the right and the wrong analysis. Remember, you have to have those three suspects the initial clues, the initial reading of the crime scene or the initial set of information that you're providing should give you enough to start looking into two or three different directions, two or three suspects. And then when the detective follows each clue, the story unfolds and you don't have to do all the analysis right all the time. Then you have to understand the social setup, the social hierarchy, especially in the British books, the, the lords or the uh, other army majors, or you see the social hierarchy in a lot of these uh, stories. You can have the timeline based on uh, the travels, the what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, Timeline is related to the crime and how different people fit in that, as well as in which particular time that event is happening. So, for example, uh, you cannot have mobile app based phones in 1980s or 1990s. You just have simple phones where people can call each other. So, uh, the GPS system was introduced later. Earlier, it was only used by uh, the US military. So you have to understand what kind of technological transformation is available. Same way the power structures. Um, uh, at, at one point of time, uh, industrial revolutions, uh, who were the big gainers and who were the big losers? Why were the, the laborers or the labor class angry at the uh, the rich class or the government for that matter. What kind of tools were available? Uh, what kind of forensic methods were available uh, at that time? Uh, if the dental marks or uh, the fingerprints or the DNA analysis, at what time all these things or technologies were used and what is the timeline associated with these technologies? You cannot have a person calling for a DNA test and he's having the results in 30 minutes. If I, I don't know if that's possible, but you have to do your study. Like fingerprints, you can match, you can run a database. Uh, matching a fingerprint versus uh, running a facial recognition, these two, even with computers, will take time. So you have to understand when and how these technologies were adopted and what was the level of uh, accuracy. Then again, dresses, lifestyle, customs. If some person is hiding guns in a dress or in a jeans pocket or in a jacket, uh, are you putting up the right uh, set up there? Are you putting the right dresses and lifestyle? A global cultures. Uh, again, in Sherlock Holmes and Akuparo, you see people traveling a lot. Uh, 
uh, people coming from India, Australia, South Africa, because these were old colonies, British colonies. Even I think the very first story of Sherlock Holmes has uh, a connection with America. I think it's the Mormons, if I'm not wrong. So <clears throat> a sign of four has a connection to Andaman Nicobar and it's actually the sign of four in Punjabi language. The story unfolds like that. So global cultures, if you want to introduce, you should have some connection to that. I mean, you cannot say that uh, in Lahore or in New Delhi, there are ports and uh, the sailors are frequenting there. You will have traders there. But if you want Mumbai, Kolkata or Chennai or Kochi or Vishakhapatnam, then you can have sailors, you can have ships or pirates. So understand the social structure as well as the geography of your story setting. And uh, one important thing is the social power or the privilege of the detective. Uh, and that is why writing female detectives is difficult because even when female detectives were, if you want to write them as the privileged class, the privileged class females were also not given a lot of freedom in uh, British era in 40s or 50s. And if you want to write it now, then you have to understand what kind of challenges those females are facing. So be very careful in writing your detective from that way. Uh, information asymmetry, although we see right now that a lot of information is available to us on our finger trip, finger trip but uh, just by typing something on the mobile doesn't mean you are getting accurate information. So traditionally in the detective stories, uh, this information is about marriage, birth and death records, medical and dental records, wills and other legal instruments, travel and foreign state details, you know, difficulty level in getting that information. I mean, today, if I'm flying somewhere, you can get that information from the airport security camera, from the airlines, you can get that from my credit card, you can get that from my, uh, if I'm using a website, if you hack my mobile phone, if you hack my email, if you can hack my printer, so how do you get that information? You have to understand that, okay? Or my uh, Facebook page that I'm posting the details every minute or every hour or uh, by overhearing or eavesdropping or somebody is being followed or being hacked, that information is being shared. Then background or past life of the victim, how can we get those criminal records or the historical records related to any kind of uh, illness or any kind of travel. So you will see that uh, Sherlock, Quaho, uh, they will have access to this information by going to the right department. Uh, but for a detective such as uh, uh, Miss Marple or uh, other non-police related detectives, this information may not be available. So you have to ensure how do you find that information. A person might be saying I'm traveling to New Delhi, but actually is traveling to Mumbai. A person goes to or buys two tickets of the train or of the aeroplane, which are at the same time and then decides to take one. So the more complexity you add, uh, the better it becomes. But remember to manage the complexity. Again, the procedures and risk, police procedures, who calls the detective? Why is the detective called? Is the detective welcome or not? Is there any physical risk to the detective? Uh, is that a situation where the uh, the person actually wants to hurt the detective or a loved one of the detective? Uh, what is at stake if wrong suspect is pursued or arrested? Uh, so we will discuss this next week if a very, uh, if a strong politician or a godman or a businessman is arrested or is being, called out as suspect, what kind of impact that will have on the department and the personal reputation of the detective. Uh, reputation or employment risk for the detective or friends. So if you are writing a police detective, you know the police have to work within the bounds, especially when challenging the privileged people or uh, people who have connects with the high ups in the government or in the executive.
a timeline related to forensic test versus detectives methods so if you want to showcase that detective can do something better uh, show that up front in the story when you introduce the detective rather than at the time when the detective is reviewing the evidence and again as and when the newer technologies are introduced for criminal forensics this is a very common theme in the recent at least in the tv series that you have a detective against the latest technology gadgets and how the detective either learn from them work with that team or beat that particular technology to find the right culprit so uh, this is a list of forensic methods i'll just go alternate you can have uh, DNA analysis, fingerprint, ballistics, the bullet and the gun, blood and body fluid, poison, trace evidence, uh, human remains, crime scene, dental evidence, tool marks, what kind of tool was used because you can uh, confiscate that tool and look for the fingerprints or the blood on that particular tool, shoe print, tire track, handwriting, facial reconstruction, uh, digital forensic, ballistic gel testing, uh, fire investigation, and voice analysis, video, blood spatter. Blood spatter has actually created a different section, uh, what Dexter did. Uh, anthropometry, human body for identification, soil analysis, hair and fiber analysis, glass, a broken glass fragment, weather, uh, it is from a particular glass type, a specialized glass, uh, how it can be related to the crime scene, the fingerprint development, uh, as well as the computer forensics, not just digital, but the computer as such. If you want to know more about that, uh, this is a Eugene Francois Vidoc, actually is considered the father of modern criminology. He was a criminal turned criminalist, a first criminal investigative agency, as well as uh, head of the first known private detective agency. I think there is a group called Vidoc Circle. They actually help some people to analyze their cases, which is a, like a real life example of detective agency or a group, people working together. Any questions till now on the story aspects? So these are the components of the story. You can write down the ideas around these uh, components and then try to create a story. Uh, next time we will have the tips of what to do, what not to do while writing detective stories and frequently use themes. So after going through a lot of uh, crime drama, listening to a lot of stories, there are at least 10 to 15 themes that you can use. We'll discuss that next time. However, today we have discussed the literary and TV detectives that you can review, use of human emotion and psychology in detective techniques, as well as some essential components of detective fiction. Any questions till now on today's session? So I mentioned this earlier. I would like you to go read and analyze one of the one or two of the stories, find the strengths and weaknesses of the detectives, think of alternative ending, think of the uh, the red herring, how different characters, how different suspects play with each other, uh, how the story progresses, how the clues are unfolded in different phases, or uh, <clears throat> how the detective makes sense of some clues. At times, it can be a bad or a funny statement by detective sidekick. And try making one of the characters from the story a detective. So imagine there is no detective. Who is the person from the story who can solve the crime? I think we are finishing right on time today. Any questions, any story analysis that you wish to share, please share it with storiesanddoodles.gmail.com. And, and uh, other than that, uh, on WhatsApp also, you can send the message. Uh, any other questions or on any other, uh, any other forum today that you would like me to address? If you want, 
detailed analysis of any of the studies or any oh, sorry any of the stories please let me know i'll see if i have time 22nd is a day off so i can do a little bit extra work on that day however overall uh, <clears throat> on the similar theme i will be covering the adventure stories as well as the mythology uh, there will be only three more lectures from next week onwards one lecture per week in any case you have my contact information my email my phone any doubts please feel free to reach me so if there are not any more questions i wish you all a good evening and uh, jabhim